back in January, back in January 10th, 2015, the musical Hamilton premiered right here at Joe's Public Theater. Hello everyone, I'm Ariel with Urbanist, and this is a show where I explore cities all around the world. It's history, food, and culture, and all of its wonders, all mostly on live video, so you can join me along for these rides. Share this video right now with your friends and family if you love history and want to share a little bit of New York City history with them. So, Hamilton premiered here in January 10th, 2015. Now it's known as one of the biggest musicals in all of Broadway history. Star, written and starred by a fellow Puerto Rican American, Lynn Manuel Miranda. But what if Hamilton premiered the same day that another production of Alexander Hamilton premiered only about, let's say, 10 blocks away? Let's say that this play, this musical, the stars of all a cast from people from all around the world, hip-hop musical, taking their own take on the American hero. But just about 20 blocks away, you had, let's say, like Clint Eastwood was also premiering a play on Alexander Hamilton. Except this is all very old school. Everyone in the cast is pretty much old white men, and it's very classic. How do you think people would feel to see two productions of Hamilton happening at the very same time. Well, this didn't actually happen for Hamilton, but it happened about 100 years prior for a little Shakespeare play. It's actually one of my favorite Shakespeare plays known all around the world for it being a very bloody, bloody affair. And that play is Macbeth. Today we're going to learn about how a play by William Shakespeare ignited a riot of over 10,000 people along Astor Place, right between the East Village and the Greenwich Village in the neighborhood of NoHo. This was one of the biggest riots in American history and it was all started by a Shakespeare play. But this ties into a curse from the Shakespeare play that has lingered around before this riot occurred and after this riot occurred. So we're going to find out, is there a curse in play for William Shakespeare's Macbeth? What happened in this riot and how bad was it? Stay tuned, everyone. I'm Ariel with Urbanist. Let me know exactly where you're watching from, and let me know what's your favorite Shakespeare play. Of all the Shakespeare plays you might have seen, and I bet you most of you have seen at least one or some, a play based on this existence before. Let me know in the comments, what's your favorite Shakespeare play? For me, Macbeth is one of my top favorites because it was always very gritty, very violent, very easy to understand. Uh, the story has been repeated and many times after that. So let me know. Let me show you where we're where we at right now and then we're gonna get into the story. Hello everyone, we are right now in front of the Joe's Public Theater, Joe's Pub. The public theater used to be the Astor Place Library. Hello Lou, hello Gwen. Hello, Pauline. Hello, Michelle. Hello, Kay. I'm so glad you're looking forward to this. Hello, Tuba. Hello, Taro. Baji. Hello, Lou. Hello, Janelle. Hello, Donna. Hello, Wilma. Hello, Murray. Helen. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for asking. And we are right by Lafayette Street. And right by... Hey, how's it going? <laughs> right by Lafayette Street. And we're only a few... About a few steps away from Astor Place, where the main action took place. Now, the Joe's Public Theater is a gorgeous theater. Home, the first home of Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton. Has been the theater here, I think, since the 70s, before it was a library. And it's also the filming location for a favorite show of mine called Mozart in the Jungle, which is about um, 
classical musicians in New York City. Now, right in front of here, we have Colland Road, Row, which is a row of houses. It used to be 10 houses, now it's only five. It's covered in scaffolding right now, but it's one of the finest examples of Gilded Age architecture here in New York City. And this was one of the very first major mansions for the heavy industrialists that were based in New York City. Uh, people like John Jacob Astor lived here. Also, the Vanderbilts lived right here in Colondon Row, and they're doing a great job in restoring it. Let me zoom in a little bit. Hello, Elaine. Coming next month, and hopefully we bump into each other. I hope so, too. And Lou, I'm so glad you love this area, and some of, some of Shakespeare's stuff is hard to follow. I can imagine. Hello, Lauren. And you love Midsummer Night's Dream. Ooh, me too. That is Shakespeare's first play, and he did a great job at it. All right, so we are basically in the East Village, right between the East Village and the Greenwich Village. This neighborhood is called NoHo. I usually associate more with the East Village. And yes, beautiful scaffolding. Also, the longest running play, off Broadway play is right here and that's the Blue Man Group. So a lot of theater history here, but this was the main theater district in New York City. However, let's go back to Shakespeare's time. Shakespeare wrote Macbeth. Macbeth is arguably Shakespeare's maybe second bloodiest play after Titus Andronicus. Now, Macbeth is a tale of a man who wants to be king, the king of Scotland. And this man wants to be king, but not sure what to do with it because there's already a king in charge. And he's coerced by his wife, Lady Macbeth, to murder the king that's currently in charge in order to take the throne. What ensues is a bloody play of war, of infighting, of murder, of intrigue, and suicide. It is a very, very hectic play. Cue the ambulance. However, something strange happened the very first ever production of the death. Let's wait for the So this is William Shakespeare. Many of you already know him. He's written many plays. Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, Twelfth Night. The list goes on. I love many of his plays. But something strange happened the very first night that this man premiered Macbeth. Shakespeare was an actor and also a playwright. This time, he wasn't really acting for his first showing of Macbeth. First showing of Macbeth happened, and suddenly, something strange happened. Lady Macbeth, the man who played Lady Macbeth, suddenly die. Now, I say man because almost every play during that time was played, every single role was played by men. Women weren't really allowed to be on the stage, especially on such a grand stage such as the Globe Theatre. So Lady Macbeth passed away. Shakespeare had to fill in for the role subsequently. But what happened? Why did Lady Macbeth pass away? That was rather strange. Many years later, let's zoom straight to the 1700s, and there's a performance of Macbeth happening once again. In this performance of Macbeth, the person who's carrying one of the daggers, one of the main characters, Macbeth, about to kill Duncan, another character who was the king, the Scottish king in the play, the dagger was replaced with a real dagger, and suddenly, during the play, when he stabbed, when Macbeth stabbed King Duncan, the actual actor that was playing King Duncan died right on stage, shocking everyone. This was starting to frighten people. Let's go forward, way after where our story is today, to Laurence Olivier playing Macbeth in the 1930s on stage. Laurence Olivier also has a scene, but one of them with the sword. 
And while he's doing the scene with the sword, the sword breaks in half, breaks in half and flings towards one of the audience members. Hits one of the audience members right in the front. Now, this is a blunt sword meant for theater. But the sword hit the man with such force and ferocity that he ended up having a heart attack and passed away that very night. Zoom a few years later, actors like Ian McKellen and Charleston Peston also played Macbeth, and they were gravely injured. No, not gravely, but seriously injured during playing Macbeth. Charleston Heston suffered burns that he had scars until the day he died from that play of Macbeth. So what is happening here? Well, in the theater world, if you're inside a theater, like this one right here, if you're inside a theater, you can't say the name Macbeth. They don't call the play Macbeth if it's playing inside the theater, they call it the Scottish play. So if I step inside this theater right now and were to utter the name Macbeth, people would stop me. Because in the theater world, people don't like saying the name Macbeth inside the theater. But why is that? Well, there's a theory. There's a theory that Shakespeare was such a great writer that he ended up using actual incantations from real witches in England. In the play Macbeth, there's three main witches. And let me find uh, the image right now and let me know where you're watching from. Let me know what's your favorite Broadway, what's your favorite Shakespeare play. Three sisters. In the play, they weren't actually called witches. They were referred to just three ugly sisters. But he was pretty much insinuating that they were witches. Their famous line is, double double bo uh, double double toil and trouble and Shakespeare apparently used real curses from real witches well when the witches of England found out that this man used actual curses one of the covens decided to curse the play and hence the very first Lady Macbeth in the very first production of Shakespeare's Macbeth passed away, and Shakespeare had to take on the role. They cursed the play that if you were to utter the name of Macbeth inside any theater, harm would come to the actors or to people in the audience. So no one to this day says, says the name Macbeth. Even in the last production that I saw of Macbeth back in Lincoln Center Theater about four years ago, even Ethan Hawke, who played the main character, did not say the name Macbeth inside the theater. He luckily had no uh, injuries come to him. However, what happens if you do say the word Macbeth since then inside the theater? Well, apparently you have to turn around three times, spit on the floor, and uh, say some incantation or some, or some curse word out loud. And the the uh, curse is lifted. But if you don't do that, then harm will come to all those who say the name of the Scottish King inside the theater. So let's walk away from the theater and not say Macbeth too many times around the theater. Okay. <laughs> but how, what, what happens when Macbeth is playing here in New York City in 1849, May 10th, 1849? Well, it would be okay, it would be normal. Macbeth usually doesn't draw any ire from people, but this time it did, because only about 20 blocks down that way on the Bowery, there was a production of Macbeth starring one of the greatest American actors of 1849, Edwin Forrest. He was a very typical, rugged looking American actor had a ferocity when he played Shakespearean characters. The Americans loved him. And this was only about a few decades after the War of 1812. So there was starting to... The, the, the American pride started to really mature, started to become a thing. But right here, only a few blocks away, 
was another production of Macbeth, right here in what used to be the Astor Place Theater. Now this was the site of the Astor Place Theater. Let me show it to you. Hello Alda, hello Wilma, hello Casey. No, that's Edwin Booth, uh, who was active just shortly after uh, Edwin Forrest. Edwin Booth became even more famous than Edwin Forrest. Uh, but yeah, very close names. Uh, Edwin Booth was also uh, known for Shakespeare. So before this building stood, this was built in the early 1900s, around 1907. This was the theater that stood right here, the Astor Place Theater, one of the grandest theaters in all of the city, built on the very outskirts of the city, meant for the arrest, uh, aristocracy of the city, right next door to their mansions. Vanderbilt's and Astor's, as you know, were one of the richest people in almost the entire world at that point. And this theater was no different. This theater, these seats were expensive, they were reserved seating, and also there was box seating all around, usually relegated to the very rich and famous. And if you were poor, you could buy seats, but you were relegated to sit on the very third floor mezzanine with very thin seating, only accessible by a little tiny staircase all the way on the top. It wasn't quite the most friendliest to all the classes of New York City. Down there in the Bowery was the Bowery Theater where Edwin Forrest was playing. And in the Bowery Theater, Edwin Forrest, uh, that theater was open to all the classes. Generally, anyone could afford it. Here's Astor Place, beautiful, gorgeous. Right there is Cooper Union, very popular school. Abraham Lincoln did his most famous speech here, four scores and seven years ago. They're right here in Cooper Union, that's where he got famous. And now this is a very relatively peaceful square. If you take away the skateboarder kids who hang out here in the weekends and the party goers who gather here late at night after getting smashed and drunk in the nearby bars, it's relatively peaceful. So what happened? You have two rival actors playing Macbeth. Now, they were rivals because Edwin Forrest was, as I said, a rugged American actor. Now, the person playing Macbeth here in the Astor Place Theater the same day, right here, modern day Starbucks, was William McCready. William McCready was a very high class English actor coming back from London. Very high class. He had kind of a of a refined feeling to his acting. And these two guys were playing. And William McCready was apparently hissed at one of his shows in Edinburgh about a year before 1849. In 1848 he was hissed at a show in Edinburgh. Now, he was hissed at a show in Edinburgh, apparently by Edwin Forrest. Now, Edwin Forrest hissed at William McCready because apparently William McCready told, said something bad or something rude about Edwin Forrest. And Edwin Forrest being a very uh, brunt, blunt, forward-thinking um, American, just decided to just immediately react and hiss at his play in Edinburgh. William McCready did not like that at all, but this ignited something within Americans. Americans were very proud that Edwin Forrest was kind of basically giving the finger to this high-class 
English actor. Now, William McCready wasn't actually a high-class English actor. He became an actor because he couldn't afford law school, and acting was the next best thing, but he just became super good at it. So, let me show you photos. This was William McCready. And that black square is that scene anywhere else. The Alamo, that's the Alamo Cube. I don't think there's any more Alamo Cues around the world. And this was Edwin Forrest. Photo of him, which is cool. All right, so, William McCready, Edwin Forrest. They already don't like each other. Edwin Forrest, his scene at McCready's show in Edinburgh. A lot of English people now liking it, a lot of Americans actually happy that Edward Force is giving McCready a hard time. William McCready is playing here in the Astor Place Theater. A theater really meant for the most rich people of New York. Edward Force playing the same night, about 20 blocks away at the Bowery Theater. So, what happens? Well, there was a man by the name of Isaiah Renders, and Isaiah Renders was associated with Tammany Hall, which was a very corrupt political organization that ruled over New York City for many decades. They had strong ties to the gangs that were only a few neighborhoods down at Five Points. Five Points was the main low-class neighborhood, mostly filled with Irishmen and African Americans who were the poorest of the poor, and the Irish usually formed major gangs that fought against the nativists of New York. Tammany Hall had ties to these gangs, one of these gangs being the Bowery Boys. The Bowery Boys were known for wearing their huge top hats, usually when they fought against other gangs. Now, Isaiah Renders decided to buy a bunch of tickets for uh, this Astor Place theater showing. He bought a bunch of tickets and started giving them out for free to many of these gang members in a tiny little bar called McNulty's on Doyer Street before it became Chinatown. He started giving away all these tickets. And as he started giving away all these tickets, all these gang members started going to the theater showing at 7 p.m. that night of May 9th, 1849. They went to the show, brought with them a lot of vegetables and fruits, and during the play started throwing it right at William McCready and all the other actors. William McCready decided to stop in the middle of the play and kind of just stare them down and see if they would be too embarrassed to continue. However, these gang members didn't give a shit. They continued throwing stuff on the stage. As Lady Macbeth, the actress that was playing Lady Macbeth, tried to enter the stage, they started screaming obscenities at her and she hurried back out stage. The play was very difficult to continue, but William McCready decided to stop, and they stopped the play, canceled it, and went immediately back to his hotel room. He was so shaken up by the entire affair that he decided to not play it again. He did not want to return the next night on May 10th. However, the aristocracy of New York City really liked Willie McCready and they wanted him to continue his tour de force performance of Macbeth at the Astor Place Theater. So a few people in the high class such as Washington Irving, Herman Melville, and many other esteemed New York City residents made a public letter asking Willie McCready to please return for his next performance of Macbeth. And, of course, Willie McCready decided to return. He was ensured that he'll be safe for his second performance, and they continued on. May 10th, 1849. Now, this is where things get really spicy, because all of a sudden, William McCready is told to... William McCready is continuing on with the play. He's shaken up. He's scared. Again, 20 blocks away, Edwin Forrest is also doing his play. This time, not Macbeth. He's doing a play uh, called The Glad Gladiator, which was written by an American playwright and was an American born and bred play. It stood a lot for American values. So a lot of people who were watching 
this play, Gladiator, they were really proud of America finally finding its voice in theater. But they were still really pissed off that Englishman was playing a Macbeth right here in Astor Place. So Isaiah renders the man associated with Tammany Hall again bought tickets. This time he bought twice as many more tickets and starts giving them out to all the different gangs of New York. Many of them, the Barry Boys, many other Irish gangs in Five Points, the roughest of the roughest people at that time. This was going to spell bad news. A lot of people did not want the play, the theater, to continue with the showing, despite the outcry of the high-class residents of New York. Firemen started gathering all along the streets. Police forces started gathering. There was rumorings that uh, the gangs were going to show up, not just to the theater, but also outside. So more police started showing up. The mayor called about a third of the police force to come to Astor Place. Third of the major police force was already gathered outside. People were on looking, curious as to what was happening. The play started at 7 p.m. As the play started, the people in the front ushers started rejecting many of the gang members, not allowed to come in with their tickets to see the play. They were already starting to get really pissed off, so more and more started gathering outside. A few of them managed to get in. As the play started at 7 p.m., they started getting inside, the play started going smoothly, but then fruits and vegetables were being thrown on stage. This didn't deter William McCready, who kept going nonetheless. Fruits, vegetables thrown on stage, people screaming obscenities at him. Us, uh, police officers were inside the theater dragging out the gang members and putting them down in the storage house in the basement of the theater and basically holding them prisoner for the duration of the show. McCready kept going on. By 8 p.m., the, the people who were held prisoners temporarily in the basement of the theater started to make a fire. And they were, their intention was to set the theater ablaze and burn everyone inside. Luckily, the police stopped that right in the nick of time, and the fire did not start. And as McCready is getting to the climax of Macbeth, in the climax of Macbeth, there is a battle scene of one of the rival lords coming to take back the country from this murderous, deceptive man who became king. Outside was a very different story. Outside, more than 10,000 people crowded this entire area. A third of the police force was here. The mayor called in the National Guard to bring in their weapons and their cannons just in case this theater, this uh, gathering outside got very rowdy. They started getting very rowdy. They took out cobblestones from the very streets. You see a few cobblestones still surviving around. They started throwing it up to the lights around Astor Place. This was already late at night because it was March. Uh, it was May, so light was starting to go down. The moon was a little bit full, so light was still streaming in for the moon, but all the lights were taken out by cobblestones. So many of the streets were in complete darkness. The gangs started fighting throwing cobblestones to the police officers, the firemen, and the National Guard. The National Guard, the police officers, and, and, uh, and the firemen started fighting back. Firemen trying to put up the fires from the uh, lights that were taken down. Shots started being fired towards the crowd. The gang members started throwing their axes and their cobblestones back at them. And as the shots were being fired, all the onlookers started panicking and people started running all around. Some of them even joined in the fight to get a little piece of the action. The entire reason they were fighting against each other was because 
these people who were either newly come to America or really wanted to, they want, they came to America, were subjugated, really wanted to fit in. And by fitting in, they wanted to fit into this American spirit, this American working class culture. So they were fighting against the aristocracy of New York City because they thought to them, to themselves, that these guys were taking them down. They were greedy. They were underpaying all these workers. They were the reason why many of these Irishmen were subjugated. So that's a lot of the reason why they were fighting back. So as shots started being fired in every single direction, people in the buildings all around started being hit. In one of the balconies across the theater, a stray bullet hit one of the windows and killed an elderly woman. And once that happened, all hell broke out loose. The National Guard gathered the cannons on this side of Astor Place and started shooting towards the crowd. Yep, actual cannons shooting right into the crowd of people all around. They weren't just gang members, they weren't just angry Irishmen, they were also women and children. William McCready kept doing the play nonetheless, and the play came into the completion because the entire theater was actually boarded up and closed up, so no one was able to get inside, and no one was able to get out. William McCready, after the fact, apparently many critics said that this was his finest performance due to the irony of the line spoken, because in, in Macbeth, as I mentioned, there's an actual war scene of people coming to storm the castle. Well, people were storming the theater that night, and those lines spoke a little bit more poignantly when said that particular night. The play was finished, but the riot was continuing on. And by the end of this riot, many hours later, as the crowd started dissipating, the, ro the, gang, the Irish gang started roving the streets trying to hunt down William McCready to try to find him and murder him. Around 30 people died. Hundreds were injured. This was one of the largest riots in American history. About the second, third largest riot in New York City history after Civil War draft riots, also which contained a lot of Irish gangs. But what happened to William McCready? Well, William McCready was very sneaky. He was such a good actor that he put on the disguise at the end of the performance and snuck out and no one was able to tell. He went to his hotel room and immediately left to Boston. William McCready left unscathed. But the people surrounding it, not so much. So imagine coming back here and seeing cannons flying about, gunfire uh, going about, hitting everywhere. All because of a tiny little production of Macbeth. And that begs the question, was this the curse of the Scottish play? Did this very riot happen because of the incantations spoken by the coven all those hundred years ago that cursed the very first production of Macbeth? Hmm. No one knows. But we do know that ever since that production, there was an inherent class struggle with uh, theater productions. And that's why even to this day, Shakespeare plays in America kind of seen as elitist. Typically, Shakespeare plays in the city are played mostly by the very high-end theater venues. And just by common American culture, we kind of scoff at the snobbishness of Shakespeare. I mean, it's not as serious, but uh, I wonder if that had the effect on us today. So, 
that is the Esther Place riots that might have been caused by the curse of the Scottish play. So remember, next time you do see a production of Macbeth inside any theater, don't say the word Macbeth. Call him either the Scottish King and call it either the Scottish play, but never utter the M word inside a theater. I hope everyone enjoyed the story. That's the end of my story. Uh, press that heart button if you enjoyed it. And let me show you a little bit more of Astor Place so you get a little bit more of the view as we walk around. Francis is a Hubble, bubble, foil, and trouble. Yes. I love how uh, in different variations people have made different ways of saying those lines. As is written in the original play, I think is Bubble, Bubble, Toil, and Trouble. And Vivian, I'm doing well. Gracias por mirando. Estamos hablando de la, de, de la, de la obra Macbeth by William Shakespeare. Sunshine, thank you so much. I'm glad you love the narration. Francis, hello. Glenda, hello. <laughs> Helga, I'm doing well. Paul, you say Lincoln's speech at Cooper Union was the A house. Cannot divide sand. Oh, okay. Thanks for clarifying. And the black square seen anywhere else. Yeah, this is the Astor Place cube. Over right here, very iconic. Installed in the late 70s around there and here is, was the original site of the Astor Place Theater is now currently a Starbucks I'm not sure if the curse still stands inside the Starbucks and sunshine you said not uh, people were calling you but were like not now uh, I'm watching my favorite <laughs> urbanist oh that's so awesome <laughs> thank you for rejecting uh, your current calls and K, you started to get with throw also droves when my lives are not on. I'm glad you were able to tune in. Astor Place since then has changed a lot. It has went from a place where the rich of New York City lived to a industrial neighborhood. That's why you see all these larger buildings with very large windows they were all built originally for industry the rich continue to move up further up fifth avenue since all the industry came over here and since then it has become a bohemian center and still kind of stays a bohemian center though it's becoming classier uh, every single day very hot property is built here such as the ibm center right here smartest one of the smartest supercomputers are stored right inside this building uh, the Facebook offices are right here as well. The Facebook New York offices are right here. And the original building was destroyed back in like 1890 around there. That's when it was destroyed. Uh, because this area wasn't really a theater area uh, by the late 1800s. It was mostly industrial. So no one was coming here for the theater. The original Bowery Theater about like 20, 30 blocks away, was destroyed many decades later in the early 1900s. Um, and that stayed for quite a while. Um, and the reason was there was a lot of theater here in the early 1800s along Lafayette Street uh, and down the Bowery. So this was the original theater district of New York City. It still is like off Broadway theater district because you have Joe's Public Theater. Joe's Public Theater, you have the, I think the new Master Place Theater, which is uh, where the Blue Man Group plays. And there's a few other smaller theater venues all around this area. And then there's a block, a few blocks down, where you have the, um, the 4th Street Theater, and a few other theaters that are currently like off-Broadway places. Now this Starbucks is kind of funny because I remember there was one time in the early 2000s where there were so many Starbuckses in the city that I sat right in front 
of that Starbucks drinking a nice caramel macchiato and as I looked down that way there was another Starbucks right in that corner that's how many Starbucks there were so I'm Ariel with Urbanist if you enjoyed this video share, like this page if you want to see more videos like this and share this video with your friends and family if you want to show them the beauty uh, and history of New York City. Um, I won't be going live so often as I used to uh, because I'm working on a documentary series that I want to do on urbanists and also I'm trying to find better, cooler stories to talk about. So bear with me these upcoming weeks. Um, but if you're enjoying these videos, thank you so much for tuning in uh, and sharing and liking. And if you're donating, thank you so much for your donations. If you want to see any particular places in 360 video, let me know. You'll see a 360 video of Astor Place uh, where I'll talk a little bit more about the general history um, about tomorrow or the day after. So thank you everyone so much for tuning in. I'm Ariel with Urbanist and always keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Have a great day everyone. Bye bye and don't say Macbeth. <laughs>